Hi, this is Trevor. Before the podcast starts, I just wanted to let you know that my new book, The Weekly Writing Routine Workbook, is now available on my website as well as Amazon and all the major online retailers. The workbook is a companion to the 12-week year for writers and will help you create a powerful custom writing routine that fits the way you work. Hello, welcome to the Get Your Writing Done podcast. I'm Trevor Thrall, author of The 12-Week Year for Writers. If you like today's podcast, please give it a review wherever you get your podcasts. That really helps. And for updates on the pod and other writing resources, please subscribe to my newsletter at getyourwritingdone.com. In his recent book, Feel Good Productivity, YouTube sensation Ali Abdal offers a fantastic metaphor for thinking about approaching the challenges and obstacles we face in life. <clears throat> Imagine, he says, that you want to run to a friend's house to attend a party. But shortly after you take off running, you feel a terrible pain in your foot and you stop. What do you do? Well, option one is do nothing. It's painful after all. Too painful to keep going. So you just turn around and walk home. Option two is increase your motivation. Remind yourself what a great party this is going to be and how much you want to go. And use that extra juice to power you through the pain. So you keep running. Unfortunately, only to collapse about 10 minutes later uh, in pain with a swollen foot. At which point you say, I just need a little more motivation. I just got to stay motivated. I can make it. Third option is to exert some discipline. Don't worry about the motivation part. Be disciplined. Just suck it up. Just do it. Ignore the pain. Ignore all those warning signs and the daggers of pain shooting up your legs as you run. Uh, and you finally arrive at the party, you know, only maybe for your friend to have to take you to the hospital uh, to deal with your bloody stumps. Um, and the final option, option four, is you could actually just sit down, unlace your shoe, and figure out what the problem is. And once you found the rock that was digging into your foot, you could just dump it out and continue running onto the party pain-free. Now, I love this story because... It helps simplify the complex. It makes it provides an easy to remember uh, story about some pretty important things, uh, and isn't that just the goal of, of all teaching? So you know, kudos. Really recommend the book. Uh, but for today, the important thing about this story is that it sets up the question at the heart of our conversation, and that is, do you have a rock in your shoe? <laughs> Let me start by defining what I mean by rock. I don't just mean a garden variety obstacle to getting things done, like, oh, you didn't quite have enough time this week to write, or, <clears throat> you know, you got a little interrupted by, um, you know, social media today, or uh, you wish your chair was more comfortable, right? Those are, those are things, but those are not rocks in your shoe. By a rock in your shoe, I'm talking about a big obstacle, something that's keeping you from doing the things you really want to do or from reaching the goals you want to reach. Like, you know, why haven't you started that book that you keep talking about? Why haven't you started that newsletter that you want the world to have? Why are you having so much trouble sitting down to work on your dissertation or your master's thesis? In short, what I mean by a rock in your shoe is a big honking productivity or even a dream killer. Now, there's a lot to say about these kinds of things. We're only going to touch the surface, really, of this conversation. But I want to make three, I think, useful observations about rocks. Um, and then we'll talk about the response. Right? So one of the things I like to do, and if you've listened to the podcast, you already know this, um, whenever I think about a topic, I like to create categories. That's what academics do, is they categorize things. It's one of the basics. Um, so, you know, like, what are all the different kinds of rocks that can get in your shoes? What kind of buckets do they fall in? Sometimes that really helps us organize our thinking about things. Now, <laughs> as I started to think about rocks, I, I realized this is going to be very tough because there are essentially an infinite number of rocks. And, and I'm not, I'm not entirely sure that categorizing them is, is that useful. Um, but, but after decades of working with writers and being a writer myself and dealing with rocks in my own shoes, um, the, a lot of the most common rocks are so common that we all we all are familiar with the lists. If, I mean, if you Google top challenges writers face, it's the same 
basic list every time, right? Oh, I don't have enough time to write. Oh, I, I deal with perfectionism or imposter syndrome. Oh, I have too many distractions. I procrastinate too much. I have a lack of motivation. I have trouble with commitment or I don't, I'm not good at staying accountable or I have family or work things, you know, stuff like that. Or, you know, maybe I just moved and I'm busy or there's some kind of crisis and I'm dealing with that. So on and so forth, right? Um, and those are the things, right? If you ask people, why aren't you getting your writing done? Those are, those are the things that you hear most often, right? Now, yeah, you hear other things too, lots of other things here and there. But, but when you ask people this question, what's keeping you? These are the things that pop right to mind, right? So on the surface, it sounds like these are the things that are keeping people from writing. These are the rocks in people's shoes. But when you stare at that list a little while, it seems to be a bit thin, uh, thin in the explanatory sense. Um, pardon the dogs in the background, by the way. Yeah, sure, those are the things you say are the problems, but why are those the problems? Why are those things rocks in your shoes? And that leads us to the second thing about rocks, right? The first thing is rocks have many sources, but the second thing about rocks is they have layers. So let me let me give you an example from, from my own life, and I've told this story in other places, but... Um, but before I became a professor, a full-time professor, I was working in a non-academic job that you know, at first I thought was okay. And then not too long thereafter, I started to hate and loathe. Um, and it was sort of eating at my soul. Um, but, I, but I didn't do anything about that. I, I stayed in that job and, um, and, and it made me sort of increasingly miserable. Um, and, and, and at a certain point... Uh, you know, my wife and I went on vacation, finally got away from the kids a little bit and had a bunch of great conversations. One of them was about how miserable I was in my job. And and my wife was like, well, why don't you, you know, sounds like you, you know, want to do something else. Why don't you do that? And and I was like, well, you know, I'm, I, I'm stuck, man. I, I got to, um, I really, really, really want to teach again. I want to get back in academia. But, um, you know, I, I feel like I can't, I feel like, um, you know, I feel like I'm stuck and she, and, and I wasn't super verbal about it cause I was just, you know, confronting this for the first time in, in quite a while, a couple of years and my wife's like, well, like take, take everything else away, but what you want to do. Like if you, if, if, if there was not going to be any problems, what would you do tomorrow? And I, you know, just instantly said, I, I would go back and, and be a professor. Like if you could just, if I could just write my own ticket, like no worries about anything else going on, that's what I would do. She's like, well, do it. We'll figure everything else out. And what I realized as we had been talking was that some of the reasons that I hadn't, right, moved, right? The, the rock in my shoe on the, on, on, on the obvious layer was, was that I had the wrong job. It was the wrong job. This rock, like most rocks, had an inner layer, right? Why was I in the wrong job? Well, now the original reason was I couldn't find an academic job, but that's not necessarily always going to be the case, right? I sort of stopped looking for an academic job after a while and then started thinking I couldn't get one. Um, and it, what it turned out when you poked a little bit was that the real, the real sort of inner layer was fear, right? Fear that um, I wouldn't be able to get an academic job, fear that I wouldn't be you know, good enough to do it, um, fear of, of taking a huge pay cut because at this point we had three kids and one of my biggest concerns in life was paying for everything at that point. Uh, and, and I, you know, one of the things that's often true about terrible jobs is I got paid a lot of money to do it. And I knew I would take a massive pay cut if I stopped doing it to do something in the academic world. And so I was feared about the bills. I was feared about upending our lives if if I did this. I mean, it could mean moving across the country for a job and so on and so forth. I had, I had a lot of, there was a lot of fear there, right? And so one of the things that um, becomes really obvious when you start talking to people about their rocks is that they have layers. There's the obvious outer layer, the, the thing that seems to be stuck in your shoe. I have not enough time. I have imposter syndrome. I have the wrong job and it's keeping me from doing the thing I want to do. Right. But when you peel back a little bit, right, there's a less obvious inner layer, right? The, the why that thing is the rock. Why did I stay in the wrong job? 
it was fear. Right? Another example of a, of a rock with layers that I see a lot uh, of writers dealing with is family obligations. Right. So whether that's caring for uh, older, you know, sick relatives, or maybe helping someone with their kids, like you know, neighbor or sibling, something like that. A lot of people tell me that family obligations are a major obstacle to their ability to write. Right? Mom's raising kids, dad's raising kids, um, and you know, family obligations are a problem. Whether it's you know because of interruptions, loss of time, <coughs> or uh, you know, lack of a consistent schedule because you're running here and there all the time. You never know you. Would, your time's not your own, right? Um, and the, the time that you spend doing the family stuff, right, is, is the outer layer of that rock, right? But the inner layer, right, the one that really gets you is, is the obligation, right? The obligation layer underneath the obvious time layer, right? It's the emotional cost that you would have to pay to carve out time for your own work, to tell people no, to tell people you can't do that at that time, Right. And it's right because family's always really good at guilt tripping you. Right. So anytime you say no to them, you pay an emotional cost. So, and again, layers. So rocks have these outer and inner layers. And the outer layer is the thing we point at, in, especially in polite conversation. Um, but the inner layer is usually a strong emotion of some sort. Very often fear, sometimes shame, sometimes guilt. A lot of times an emotion you don't really want to deal with very often because it's very uncomfortable. And that's a big challenge because the third thing about rocks um, is that their inner layers are often invisible to one's self because one is not willing or interested in looking at them. Right. So, so part number three about rocks is that their inner layers, the driving engines, are often invisible. Right. And, you know, look, I'm not a psychologist. But I feel like I'm on pretty firm ground when I say that people have a hard time dealing with painful emotions. You know, it's easier to complain about your boss or your job than it is to acknowledge that you haven't done anything to look for a new job, right? I was perfectly capable of telling people how bad my old job was, but I wasn't really ready for the follow-up conversation. Well, why haven't you done anything about it, right? You know, so uh, we like to avoid thinking about the why a lot of times, right? It's easier just, you know, Keep complaining than it is to acknowledge you haven't done anything to look for a new job. It's easier to keep scrolling social media all day than it is to acknowledge that you have some kind of problem staying focused. You know, it's easier to let your parents suck up all your time than to risk the conflict, you know, telling them you need time to write. So people often avoid the real reason that's underlying the rock in their shoe. Right? And this is why when I talk with writers who are stuck, um, I often have to probe and sort of pick at them carefully to find out what's really going on. Because first they'll tell me sort of the obvious outer layer stuff, but there won't be a why attached. I'm not hearing the inner layer that's really keeping them. And so, you know, you can, you can have really unfruitful conversations trying to help a person if you're trying to brainstorm to deal with a rock without knowing why that rock is a rock, right? If you say you don't have time, but, but you're not willing to tell me what the real reason you don't have time is, then, then my suggestions are going to be stupid because I don't get what I'm really trying to help you solve, right? So, um, you know, and, and that's as a coach, that's it's frustrating because, you know, I'm trying to be helpful. And when I suggest what seem to be really reasonable ideas and they fall flat, I'm, I usually know there's an inner layer discussion that we need to have. But, you know, the problem is that confronting these kinds of fears or other dangerous emotions is just not most people's cup of tea on a typical day. So, you know, great example of this. Um, I had a dissertation student many years ago who was who was going on ten years in the PhD program. She predated, you know, my being at the at the program, in fact, and her clock was running out. You know, they, they students get ten years in the program before they get booted out by the university. No PhD for you. Um, so, you know, if she didn't finish in this next year, she was going to get kicked out. All her work, you know, kind of lost in that sense, and. Um, she came to me at one point very upset, you know, laying all this out and saying, look, I really have to finish. I'm super committed. Um, I've, you know, I've got this busy job, but I, I'm really now I'm dialed in. I, I, I will do whatever it takes. And, you know, the problem she had was pretty common. Um, she knew she wanted to get a PhD, um, but she couldn't figure out why it was so difficult to sit down and write. You know, we sort of talked about this. Um, and my sense as we 
got to talking was that her desire to get a PhD was actually far lower than her need to relax at the end of a long day at her demanding and very high paying job. Um, and, you know, I also didn't, and the, the reason I sense that is because in talking to her about her project and her plans and so on, I didn't hear any signs that she was actually very curious about her topic or very interested in the process of doing research and, you know, writing wasn't interesting to her per se. You know, she, she wanted a PhD kind of like I, you know, want to be a billionaire. Like I'm not about to do anything to get there, but like, I would like that. That sounds nice, you know? Um, and, but, but the thing that was fascinating is it was really clear to me after talking to her for a half an hour, but it wasn't clear to her, right? She was not willing to take an honest look at her own feelings. And, you know, given her situation, which, you know, I, I'm not about to tell someone, well, it doesn't sound like you want a PhD, so you should quit. Um, you know, I, I actually have said that to people, but in this situation, that wasn't the right thing to say. And I was like, okay, look, um, this, this is a tough situation. You know, I think you're going to need to really push here. Uh, if you're really serious about this. So I, I recommended that she hire a dissertation coach, you know, get, get really serious here. Like you've got the money, like hire someone to keep you on track week by week, help you make plans, help you stay accountable. She's like, that's a great idea. Hired a dissertation coach. <laughs> About <laughs> three or four months later, she stopped calling the coach. Um, and I talked to the coach after and, and the coach was like, she said, this woman, not one time did she show up having done the stuff she sort of had agreed that she was going to do in their plan she had bunked off you know several times oh i can't make it this week oh you know whatever she didn't do one thing not one thing in however three or four months to progress towards finishing not one thing you know no surprise she didn't finish um and and look you know the lesson here is not that she needed to confront her her deep-seated fears and, and whatever and write a dissertation no, no, no. In fact, the dissertation was the rock in her shoe. That was the thing keeping her from living a life that was more comfortable for her, right? The thing was she needed to get rid of the dissertation, and she could not be honest with herself about the fact that she really wasn't willing to commit the time and energy to write it that it required. She wasn't willing to admit that. And, you know, I get it. It's, it's kind of that, you know, sunk cost. She's put a lot of money into this, a lot of time, She's got an identity sort of building around. I'm a person who's pursuing a PhD. All those things are tough to give up, right? But that's the importance of being honest with yourself. And that's hard to do. And that's why for a lot of people, they can get to the end of a 10-year PhD process without ever admitting they don't want to write a PhD. It's, it's a tragedy and it's a terrible and it's a really good example of why it's really important to be on the lookout for rocks in our shoes because you can end up in really bad situations if you're not honest with yourself, if you don't dig to find the inner layer of your rocks, right? And so the problem is if you're not willing to look at the inner layer, it's going to make getting that shoe out of your rock really, really hard. If you can't admit the problem, you can't look at it objectively and you, you're not going to be able to solve the problem. So, all right, what's the rock in your shoe? Right after this brief discussion of, of rocks, do they sound familiar? I think we've all had a rock in our shoe on a you know reasonably regular basis. Um, these are just things you can't avoid in life. If you go walking, you're going to get rocks in your shoe. Um, but do you have a rock in your shoe today? Um, is there something holding you back? Is there something keeping you from getting your writing done? That's a big honking killer of your productivity or your dreams. I I encourage you to take a breakout block sometime in the next week. Go rock hunting. It's not very hard, I tell you. It's actually not very hard. I often ask uh, clients and students to do pre-mortems at the beginning of a new 12-week year. So here's your plan. You've got this nice plan. But let's take a minute and imagine that we're, we fast forward 12 weeks from now and you haven't accomplished the goals in this plan. Why? Write down the most likely reasons why you didn't get that plan done. And... It, this is not a hard thing for people to do. This doesn't take depth of creativity. Everybody knows the likeliest killers of their productivity. Now, they may not all rise to the level of a rock in your shoe, right? But sometimes, sometimes there's a, a, a rock that you know is there all the time, right? And if you walk yourself through that, right, um, what kind of challenges have been making it hard for you to write lately? Um, what's most likely to be keeping you from finishing this or, or even enjoying your current project, right? 
And once you identify these potential rocks, interrogate. What's the what's the inner layer there? Is it an outer layer that's you know just what it seems like? Uh, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit short on time because we're busier at work. Or is it a rock with a, a, an inner important inner layer? I, I'm having trouble telling the boss I can't work that much. I shouldn't be working so much overtime, but I'm afraid to say no because I'm afraid that she'll fire me or life will be miserable, right? Is there an inner layer that's really generating that rock, right? Ask yourself, why does this rock exist? And, right, if you discover that a rock does need removal, <laughs> it's time to get rid of that rock, I have a few thoughts about how to how to go about it. And so, so we talked about the rock, now let's talk about the response. I like that, the rock and the response. It sounds like a, that sounds like something, anyway. All right, so some those are some thoughts about what the rocks are like. Now let's talk about how to deal with the rock. Um, and the first, and I think most important overall thing, is to embrace a strategic mindset. So back to Ali Abdal's metaphor, right? Option one, do nothing. Um, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> that's, the, that's why you have a rock in your shoe. You've, you've got something causing you pain. You haven't done anything about it yet. Um, that's not working. Doing nothing is almost, we always try that first because it's easier than anything else. Uh, maybe it'll go away. Um, yeah, if you get lucky, sure, problems can go away, but mm, not not a lot of rocks. All right, option two, boost your motivation. Um, can you just want it enough? Um, people use a lot of, there's a lot of motivation speak in our world, and I'm a big motivation fan because I, I firmly believe that your motivation that's that's drawn from a compelling vision of your future is your most vital energy source. But But motivation doesn't automatically obliterate all the obstacles in your way. You know, like, how does being motivated make it easier to manage living with your sick parents or coping with graduate school-induced anxiety, right? Sometimes motivation is sort of skew from the problem. It doesn't resolve, I think, most rocks in our shoes, right? Um, option three was let's grit it out. Let's let's be disciplined, right? Uh, I, I love me some grit, uh, but, but only in moderation, guys, <laughs> because, yes, there are times we need to grit things out. Um, but grit is like, you know, burning the candle at, at both ends sometimes. Over the long haul, grit can easily turn into its unhealthy cousin, grind. Um, you can grit out a term paper, but maybe you can even grit out a couple years of business school. Um, but I've watched way too many people try and fail to grit it out through an entire PhD process that they didn't really want to get through to believe that grid is a strategy you can rely on for the long term. Because it turns into grind, and grind wears you down, and burns you out. And the reason you're doing that is because you're not, you're not recognizing that you have this rock in your shoe that's causing you to grind yourself to a nub for something that you clearly aren't enjoying, don't want to do, right? So, right, grit is, is a tough one. And, and again, like motivation, discipline is just not the right tool for many jobs. It, it's the right tool for sometimes, but it's not the right tool for all the problems you're going to face, right? How do you discipline yourself to find a better job? That doesn't, like, discipline doesn't make your job better, right? It doesn't make your problem go away. Um, it doesn't, discipline doesn't help you create a healthier work-life balance necessarily that leaves you more time for writing, right? Discipline has a place in your toolkit, but it is, like motivation, a fairly one-dimensional tool, right? So what's object, option four, right? Option four is be strategic, right? Figure out what the problem is, then figure out how to deal with it, right? That's the, that's the final option of you sit down and you look in your shoe. Like I got a pain in my shoe. Let me take the shoe off and figure out what I, what I have to do with it. And, and for me, you know, the, this is captured pretty well, this strategic mindset. I, you know, I call it a growth, the growth mindset in the 12 week year of writers book, right? That's now, I didn't come up with growth mindset. That's Carol Dweck, the Stanford professor who came up with this notion and it's amazing and wonderful and you should read the book. Um, but, but I think of it as one of the most cardinal sort of aspects of, of the writer's mindset, right? Because you, you're always going to have challenges and obstacles in front of you uh, as a writer, but as a person more generally, of course. Um, and the strategic mindset, like the growth mindset, says every rock is a unique challenge, um, has its own unique solution. Uh, there's no necessarily one-size-fits-all approach to being a productive person or to solving problems. Everything depends on you and, and your situation. And, and the growth mindset is so important because what it says is if you do run into a challenge, it's okay to be honest about it. It's okay to have problems. It's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be ashamed that you can't do something for the moment. 
um, all those things are okay, and you can fix them. You can grow. Um, you know, you just uh, you start with the assumption, the mindset that you can overcome your problems by searching for answers, by asking for help, by trying things until something works, right? And then you learn and you grow and you move past that rock. So every rock in your shoe is an opportunity for growth in, from the growth mindset. And the alternative to that, right, is this fixed mindset where you sort of assume, unfortunately, the opposite, which is if there's a rock in my shoe, I, I've probably hit my limit. I've probably gone as far as I can go. I must not be that good. And you give up. And so you're, you're likely back to option one if, if yelling at yourself and for motivation and discipline doesn't, doesn't do it, right? So embracing a strategic mindset is my first most majorist um, recommendation for, for getting that rock out of your shoe. And, and, and the second recommendation is, is a big part of that, and that's being honest with yourself. Um, because before you start finding solutions and being strategic, first you need to figure out what you're really dealing with. And that, that takes a lot of honesty. And, and I, I just don't think you can really build a healthy life or a healthy writing routine or anything without being honest about who you are, where you are, what things are going on in your life, and, and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, all the examples that I've given so far um, make it pretty, pretty clear that you, you're not going to deal with the outer layer very easily unless you deal with the inner layer, right? The, the what won't get fixed until the why gets fixed. And, you know, as I said, people have trouble being honest with themselves, admitting they have issues, admitting they have weaknesses, admitting they're afraid, uh, facing the things they fear, right? Not just, you know, they might tell you they're afraid, but they're not going to go any further, right? So, it's, it's tough when people are in those, um, d you know, scary emotional situations. Um, but there's just no alternative to honest self-reflection. You just, it, you have to, you know, you have to push through that fear because there's no growth without confronting your, your situation. And, you know, getting help to be honest with yourself, right? Um, I'm going to talk about that in, in a minute. All right. So, so being honest with yourself, right? And then, um, a, a third piece is um, something I'll just sort of summarize as making necessary trade-offs is important. Um, you know, look, we're not stupid people. Uh, there are usually good reason uh, why things in our lives are the way they are. In other words, like rocks aren't necessarily random. Um, we put rocks in our shoes on purpose sometimes, right? We put obstacles in front of our writing sometimes. Uh, example. We all let jobs take up our time uh, because they pay us a lot of money um, that we can then use to buy a nice house or a nice car, take nice vacations, have things, right? Uh, or we take a lot of time caring for our parents because we love them and it feels good. Or our kids, we love them. It take, feels good to care for them. It's really important to us. Um, instead of getting up before work to write, we sleep in because it feels great to stay in bed. And so <laughs> why do I bring these things up? And, and it's because this rocks in our shoes don't always just cause pain. They often cause good things. And that's tricky, isn't it? Whoa, that's a mind blower. Rocks in our shoes aren't just pain. They're pains that also deliver benefits. And it would be nice. It would be so nice. It'd be so easy if rocks were just terrible, no good things, and you would want to just banish them once and for all, and you know, then life would be good. But no, it turns out that many of them are two-edged swords. So turning up the writing knob, right, sometimes means turning down the knob on something you actually really like doing, right? So, because, you know, time time is a limited, you know, it's a zero-sum game. Every every minute you spend writing is a minute you don't spend doing something else. And so getting rid of rocks from our shoes means identifying these trade-offs, figuring out how much to change things, um, determining how much you're willing to pay to get more writing, right? Are you willing to pay the cost to make this particular change? Are you ready to get less sleep so you can write in the morning? Are you ready to tell your parents that you have to leave an hour earlier every night because you have to go home and write? Are you ready to tell your church you won't be on the committee this year because you've got to get your book finished? Right? You know you're going to pay a cost for all those things. Are you willing to pay that cost to make that trade-off between getting to spend time doing things you like or paying the cost for the conflict, right? Um, so, you know, I think the example of people who don't have enough time to write, right, is, is a good one, right? And, and when people say, oh, you know, how do you make time to write? And I said, well, you know, here's the thing. Each of my three children is a book I didn't write. 
<laughs> people, people's jaws sometimes drop. Like, oh my god, you're a terrible person. What? And after the horror and the shock wear off, and some of the nervous laughter dies down, I tell them, look, I'm completely serious. And they just think now I'm a terrible, terrible person. I said, look, you, you can't expect to have 10 kids uh, and write a ton of books, right? That's just not going to happen. Even if you're a crappy parent, if you have 10, 10 kids, I mean, they suck up a lot of time. You're not going to get much writing done. Now, look, these things are trade-offs. In my case, I was thrilled to trade a, a book for each of my kids. And all the other you know things I didn't do because I was busy changing diapers and making PBJs and coaching soccer and wrapping Christmas presents, going to ball games, camping, and doing all the other amazing things that we did as a family, right? Those were incredibly important to me. The point is, is that writing takes time. And every minute you spend with your family is time you're not spending writing. And vice versa, right? So these are these are trade-offs that you have to make. You're not trading off between bad things and writing. You're trading off between good things and writing sometimes. Now, sometimes the rock is just terrible, but sometimes it's something that, you know, is also good. And you have to figure out where's the balance, right? Um, how much time are you willing to give writing relative to all these other things? And I think that's why... Um, it's so important to have a clear sense of where writing fits in your life, you know, and in, in some of my workshops, I ask people to document how much time they've spent in the past week on all the different activities in their life. And then I said, well, how much time did you spend on writing? And, and was that as much time as you wanted? And, you know, that starts this question of why not? That starts the process of maybe identifying some of the rocks in your shoe when it comes to writing. And then the question is, are you willing to you know, are those rocks the kind of things that they're just bad things that need getting rid of? Or are they rocks, which is often very common, right, that have also good things that require trade-offs? Well, I need to spend less time with my dog. I need to spend less time doing other volunteering that I also get a lot out of because I have to get the book done, right? You can't have it all. And so making the trade-offs is part of getting rocks out of our shoes sometimes, right? So, um, it's not always easy, but that's, I think, making trade-offs is often what the process looks like. And then, finally, um, last recommendation for getting rocks out of your shoes is to find your courage, right? Um, because I think the number one reason we let rocks fester in our shoes is fear. Because um, when you peel back the layers on our challenges, it so often just turns out that fear is the root of the problem. It's scary to change. It's scary to upset apple carts. It's scary to think of doing things differently or to do without whatever comforts we've been having from the, the way things are today. Um, you know, when you're honest with yourself and you spend time contemplating that rock, that's when the rock is scariest, right? <laughs> Before you've dealt with it, it's, it, you know, that, and that's why we don't do it. We don't want to look directly at the rock because if we do, it's going to be really scary to contemplate and it's scary big rockiness. Um, and sometimes at that point, all you can think about is oh, what's going to go wrong, how bad it's going to get. You know, if you confront the issue, are things going to go to hell? Like it's good. Oh, or you might make a bunch of changes and then it won't work. You still won't get your writing done. And then what will people say? Oh, right. I mean, there's that's the moment of, of peril in your in your brain. Right. And it's often the point where people turn around and scuttle turtle and don't do anything. So the trick is to tell yourself, yeah, there's a lot of fear there. And then to be strategic, say, okay, what do you do when you're afraid? What helps when you're afraid, right? This is another thing to be strategic about. This is another thing to grow through. Fear doesn't kill you, right? Uh, not doing your writing might kill you though, because you're not gonna get the things you want in life, right? So how do we deal with the fear strategically? Now, this is not a podcast on dealing with fear per se, but let's, you know, just a, a, few, a few simple thoughts that, that might help you push through the fear, right? And the first is to bring the fear into the light. Um, you know, talk about it with other people. I've always found, I think I'm trying to remember the Swedish phrase, a, 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 a concern shared is a concern halved or, or something, or a trauma shared is a trauma halved. And I, I, I like that idea, right? That, that, you know, nothing shrinks a fear into a normal size away from nightmare proportions, like just talking about it in daylight with another person who's a thoughtful person. Um, and, you know, it's nine times out of ten, the person you're talking to has had a similar issue, something they can share, and you go, okay, I'm not alone. It's not weird that I have this thing. Everyone's afraid at first of these things. This person might have an example of how they dealt with it that's useful to you, right? So, you know, getting it out into the light, you know, in, in AA, they have a, a phrase, you're only as sick as your secrets, 
Um, I think that there's a lot of wisdom in that simple phrase that, you know, if you're letting this rock fester because you're afraid to talk about it, you probably need to talk about it. <laughs> right. And, and I, I can think of a lot of examples in life. You know, if my PhD student had come to me in year three instead of year 10 and said, yeah, I'm not sure I want to do this. We could have had a really good open conversation. I could have told her she is not the only person to feel this way. I could have connected her with people who made different decisions about stopping. She could have gotten a lot of support. And she might have been able to make that decision seven years earlier than she did and felt way better about it and gone on. Who knows what she would have done with those seven years? Much healthier, happier. You know, so bringing that fear into the light. And there's a lot of ways to do that, right? If you don't have a personal friend, maybe you, you could tell a writing group or a coach or a therapist, right? But uh, even, you know, I know like Gen Z kids, they, they'll freaking put it on TikTok and talk about there, right? Because that, that's how their generation does it. However feels comfortable to you, right? All right. A second uh, and final sort of thought um, then is to take small steps. Um, I've just uh, just recently finished my weekly writing routine workbook, and, and that's all about taking small steps toward a better and healthier routine. And and I think, you know, in, in general, when we're talking about getting rocks out of our, our shoes, that's what we're we're talking about. We're talking about building healthier routines for our writing that are closer to our ideal. And, you know, whatever that area looks like that we're talking about in terms of your rock, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the general kind of concept is to take small steps in that direction. You don't always have to quit your job like I did back in the day um, to take the rock out of your shoe. Sometimes all you do is have to make more time for your writing, right? So I know people who said, you know what, uh, my job is, you know, I can't really avoid doing my job, but I'm going to structure my morning so that I can carve out a half an hour, 45 minutes to write before I start my day job every day. I'm going to figure out how to do that, right? Carve back some time from the beast. Uh, or you might be afraid, right? The fear might be a big issue. And so small steps there are super helpful because they help you acclimate to a new reality bit by bit. Instead of being a big, huge, irreversible change, you can make small, reversible changes and see how it goes until you can verify your instincts and maybe build up some confidence. And once you've got that confidence built, um, you, can, you can press onward to bigger and better things. All right, you know, I'm sure there's a ton more we could say about rocks in our shoes. I'd be fascinated to hear from you guys. If, um, if you have thoughts about rocks in your shoes, drop me a line at the website and let me know. Uh, and until next time, happy writing.